A couple days ago, I got a new piece of equipment off of eBay. Uh, it was a device I really wanted but didn't actually expect to get. Uh, I sort of got it by accident, um, meaning I bid on it thinking, oh, I'll get outbid for sure, and then I didn't. So I paid way less than I sort of anticipated to, but I anticipated playing zero dollars because I figured I would lose it. So I didn't really intend to buy this, but now that I have it, I guess I have to show it to you. By the way, eBay is destroying me and my family. Please save me. Please help. So the device I got is this right here. Yeah, that doesn't help at all. Here, let's get a little closer and you can check it out. So this is the Yamaha CX-5M. It is an MSX computer, and if you've watched my videos before, or particularly if you just know me and my bullshit, you'll know this, this is not my first MSX computer. I have three of them now. And so you might be asking what's special about this one. Well, I wouldn't be making a video about it if there wasn't something special about it. So to cut right to the chase, you may have already noticed it says music computer up here. And that is exactly what makes this one special. If we flip this over right here, you can see this is obviously quite out of place. This is the Yamaha SFG-05 FM synthesizer unit. So they made an SFG-03 or 01, I can never remember which. And this is the newer, better version of it. Now, FM synthesis is a way of making music that doesn't require a lot of memory. It's entirely mathematical. So it was very popular for a little bit in the 80s for making sounds that were very rich and very complex, but were described entirely by numbers and formulas. So while it requires a lot of processing circuitry, it doesn't require a ton of RAM, which was an incredible premium at the time. In addition, it allows you to make completely new sounds from scratch with a wavetable sampler, which is what everything turned into a decade later, and a lot of other synthesizers that we started moving towards. You could only take pre-recorded sounds and then modify them, or you could use an analog style synthesizer, which could only work with very simple waveforms and only modify them in certain specific ways. Now you can get a lot out of that, but basically the real story I believe is that Yamaha stumbled upon FM synthesis in the early 80s and realized that this was a sound they could make entirely their own and then they proceeded to dominate the market with this for an entire decade. So this guy here is basically a standalone Yamaha FM synthesizer. It just happens to be plugged into this MSX computer. So if you look here on the end, you can see we have MIDI in and out and audio out. So the MSX computer has its own audio chip and it does in fact have its own audio output back here. These are completely separate. And part of the reason for that is this will actually come out and can be plugged into another MSX using an adapter, which I don't have. Also, Yamaha made a proprietary keyboard, which plugs in right here in this dip socket. I have no idea why it uses that instead of using actual MIDI plugs. From what I've seen, it looks like just a straightforward, ordinary keyboard. So I don't know why they didn't just make it straight MIDI. So as you can see, this is a very aesthetic little device. It almost looks like a standalone MIDI tone generator, and I sort of have the feeling that if I were to put power into the edge connector here, uh, it would actually work entirely on its own, but hey, don't quote me on that. And I'm not gonna find out either. So yeah, they sold an adapter that will let you plug this into another MSX of any kind, as from what I understand, uh, and then you could presumably run one of their software packs, because this has software built into it for doing music synthesis, uh, so obviously you would have to get some third-party cartridge in order to use this on another machine. But I don't intend to do that. I intend to just use it on this one because I like this machine. So I basically bought this because of that module and because this thing integrates with it. I thought it would be a neat addition to my collection of instruments. I'm not a very good player, but I do like collecting instruments, and I intend to become a good player at some point once I get up the gumption and willpower to practice. So when I saw this, it definitely piqued my interest, and I jumped on it right away, even though I didn't really expect to get it. All right, so this is a neat device, so why don't I have it turned on? Well, it's because I can't actually plug it into video. See, take a look at the back here. Do you recognize any of these connectors? This here is the monitor port and it is a DIN 5, which is no kind of standard. Certainly not in the US. So I had to go and look up a pinout for this, which was surprisingly not that hard to find. Um, it seems that these, among all the MSXs, are like the most common ones to have been sold here, which is unusual. MSXs had almost no presence in this country. So to explain a little bit about that, so you probably don't know what an MSX is. I've only done one or two videos on them before, and I didn't go into a lot of detail about what they were. I'm gonna do a whole MSX explainer video at some point because they really are one of my favorite types of consoles in the world. Console is even a fair term. What the MSX is, is very strange. 
It's the only thing of its type really in history. MSX was a computer standard in the same way that PC has become now, the IBM PC standard. IBM doesn't make computers anymore, and by the mid-90s, almost nobody actually had an IBM computer. They had all these knockoffs of IBM computers based on the same bus, the same CPU, the same basic peripherals. But there's no reason that the Intel 8088 had to be configured with those specific peripherals. And there were non-PC compatible, non-IBM compatible computers that used the 8088. The same is true for the 8186 and, and I think to a very limited extent, maybe some of the later processors. But by and large, most of the things that came out on the 8088 were IBM PC compatible, and that's because people wanted the ability to run software on computers that weren't all made by the same company. So for instance, if you had a Commodore 64, you could only run Commodore 64 software. Even though the same CPU was used in other machines, you couldn't reuse the software because everything else about the machine was different. The graphics chip was different, the sound was different, the layout of memory was different. Everything was different. If you wanted to run software for all of the competing machines in the early to mid 80s, you had to buy all those different machines to run all those different programs. This is so bad that a lot of the stuff for the ZX Spectrum was released simultaneously for the Amstrad CPC on the same cassette tape. You could flip it over to get to the Amstrad version or the ZX Spectrum version. So that's how wild things were at some point. So in the early 80s, Japan's division of Microsoft, yeah, did you know they had one of those? I didn't decided that they were going to make things better by making a unified standard that they would not make. They didn't manufacture any. Microsoft didn't make any MSX machines. Instead, what they did is they made a standard for the CPU, the peripherals, the memory layout, so on and so forth. They distributed that, I don't know, for free, probably? Maybe there was a license fee, I don't know. They distributed that to a whole bunch of different companies, anyone who wanted it, and then all of the electronics manufacturers in Japan made MSX computers. Sony, Fujitsu, Panasonic, uh, Panasonic's national division, in fact, the one that made typewriters, Casio, um, Sharp, I think even Epson was making them. And all the MSXs were relatively the same with some standout features. So I'll show you some examples. So this guy here, if you look at it, has a cartridge slot right there into which you could plug in a software pack just like you would with a Commodore 64. So that would be either application software, like a basic interpreter or a video game. But you could also plug in other things. It's not just software. This is the main system bus. So you could plug in all sorts of expansion peripherals here as well. So you could plug in, say, a print cartridge. Now, these machines mostly have built-in printer ports. This little port right here is for a printer. And that's actually standard, as far as I can tell, among all MSXs. But if your particular MSX was low-end and didn't come with a printer port, then you could get a print cartridge to go in here to give you that capability. You could also get com different communication cards and storage carts and memory expansions and all kinds of things. In addition, on most of these, there was another port on the back into which you could put a second cartridge. And then some machines had even more, although that's pretty rare. There's even MSXs that come in a desktop variant with a separate keyboard instead of this all-in-one design. So this Yamaha is pretty typical of most of the MSXs. They're relatively about like this. Now this is called an MSX1, colloquially. There is an MSX2, which is almost the same, except that several of the hardware components and software components have been iterated. Needless to say, of course, this being from the 8-bit computer era, this is based on a Z80 processor and comes with basic built-in. Here's one of my other MSXs. This is the Casio MX10. This is basically the cheapest one manufactured, as far as I know. This is also an MSX1, and as you can see, it only has one cartridge, and there's no slot on the back. Under this cover here, we have an expansion port, but that can't be used for other MSX cartridges. Instead, you can just use that to connect to sort of an external docking station they had that gave you more capabilities. So other than that, you also have two joystick ports, which is universal. This one has those as well. And they're the Atari joystick standard, basically. And then over here on the side, we have composite video output, RF video output, and monaural audio. So this is about as basic as you can get. It's got a chiclet keyboard, which is horrible to type on. The keys are super tiny. I only bought it because I got it for, um, well, uh, $13. But it works, and uh, it's really lightweight and portable, and I figure if I ever want to go do some MSX bullshit at somebody's house, this is the one I could bring with me. Then finally, we have the beast, the monster, the hit bit. This is one of the best MSXs you can buy. I ordered this for 400 odd dollars from Japan. 
because it was worth it to me. I wanted to get an MSX that was sort of the best of the best. And this one is just about. There are some that I find more interesting or more impressive, but this one has everything it could possibly ask for. So we've got a cartridge slot here. Then on the back, we have a second cartridge slot, so you can run two carts in this. We have a floppy drive built in, and that reads ordinary PC format floppies. So that makes it very easy to get software from this to something else, or to get files from a PC onto this. It's got a much better keyboard, obviously, than the Casio one, being that it's got actual keys. It also has a hard pause button, this uh, big yellow bar right here, and that actually freezes the CPU completely. So that'll halt no matter what you're doing. It's not a command for the program. We have this option here, which is the Renshaw Turbo. This has a built-in joystick interface. So it has a concept of a fire button, and this causes the fire button to rapidly toggle on and off whenever you press it. So it's just a turbo controller, but it's built right into the machine and it's variable speed. So anywhere within here, it's basically adjusting a little timer circuit. And then finally, this slider here, which I found minimally useful, but it is pretty cool, uh, is actually a CPU speed control. So lowering this causes the CPU to execute instructions slower. So I assume this is just adjusting the speed of a phase lock loop. And so consequently, you can use it anywhere you like and it'll always work. Although it would probably fuck up timing sensitive operations such as cassette load save, that sort of thing. Then we've got our usual joystick ports. And then around the back, we've got about what you would expect. There's your RF. That's your composite video output. That's your mono audio output. Printer port. That's your cassette deck interface. And then over here is one of the major reasons I bought this, an RGB video output. The output from the Yamaha here is exclusively composite video, which looks like shit at best, because composite video is terrible. And a lot of MSXs, such as the Casio here, and a lot of lo other lower end ones, don't have any output other than composite. There might even be one or two that only do RF, which is a hell nightmare I don't want to consider. The RGB video output from this port, however, is extremely beautiful. Uh, it looks fantastic, it's incredibly crisp and um, I just adore using this machine with that output. So I shelled out for a cable from Retro Game Cables, I think that's the name of it. I'll put a link in the description after I find it, which is a website that has a whole bunch of custom cables for all kinds of old consoles, including a lot of MSXs that adapt them out to SCART for the most part. And then from SCART, which has dedicated RGB, sync and composite and audio pins, you can then adapt to whatever else you like, such as a bunch of BNCs to plug into a PVM monitor. So I got that, so hooking this thing up is a piece of cake. Although, if you consider getting one of these, there is one caveat I'm going to establish, which is that although it has this style of plug, this is not a 110 or 120 volt device. This uses the Japanese voltage, 100 volts. Now, you can run this off 120, but I don't recommend it. I tried it for a bit when I first got it, and what I found is that the power supply got unreasonably warm, and it made me very uncomfortable. So I ended up buying a 120 to 100 volt step-down transformer, which is one of the silliest things I own, uh, but it did solve the problem and this thing runs comfortably cool now. This is an MSX cartridge. They look they look like cartridges. They look like you'd expect, like a C64 cartridge or whatever. Uh, the one difference, uh, and this is something I really like, is on the bottom here, you can see that the uh, card edge connector is not exposed. There's this little spring-loaded guard that presses back when you insert it, which exposes the card edge connector. So that basically acts as a built-in dust cover. It's pretty neat. And another thing is, if you want to collect software for these, you're pretty much shit out of luck unless you have a very big income. You can pretty much only get it from Japan, and you're looking at paying somewhere between $20 and $150 per cartridge. And if it's something rare, like Konami's Metal Gear, you're looking more at spending three to $400 last time I checked. So to solve that problem, I got one of these, which you'll probably recognize as a flash card. They're available for virtually every platform nowadays, and this has an SD card in it that has most of the MSX software library on it. This is about $187. It's made by one dude in Brazil, uh, who I respect highly for his efforts, uh, and it was worth every penny. It's a very strange device. I'm going to be doing a video later on where I go through all of that so I can demo this machine and that cartridge, because there's currently no real information online about how to use that. But for now, let's get back to the Yamaha. I just wanted to give you a sense of context. This uses a DIN 5, which you might know as a MIDI connector, to get the video out of the device. So you can't buy an adapter cable for that. I don't think Retro Game Cable sells one, and I don't really want to wait for one anyway. And it's very simple and straightforward, so I'm just going to go ahead and assemble one. So as stated, I had no trouble finding a pinout for this, and it shows very clearly here that pin 2 is ground, which is the bottom pin, and then just next to that, pin 4 carries the video, and then pin 3, which is upper on the other side, 
carries the audio. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna splice a five pin DIN cable onto a audio video RCA cable and that should be all we need to do. It'll just be ugly and miserable, but it will work. So here's our donor cables and let's get to it. We'll begin by making an incision close to the mini DIN 6 end of the cable. And right away we can see that all the wires inside are just ordinary wires. Right away we can see, right away we can see, right away we can see, right away, right away, right away. We can see that all the wires inside are just ordinary wires, not weird ass coax. That's good. Get the outer jacket off. We're going to want quite a bit of experience exposed excess to work with. We have to do some weird twiddling with these wires to get them where we want them inside of the new heat shrink insulation. Oh wow, that jacket's thick. All right, so right off the bat, you can see I've ripped off this foil here, and this foil probably would have been the outside ground. Now, fortunately, it's duplicated here. However, I'm not gonna use either of those because in this design, the MSX actually doesn't connect the outer shell to anything, which seems wild to me, but I guess, you know, do you. Now something else fascinating here is there's actually eight wires here. So that either means that they're cross connected, you know, one wire goes to multiple pins, or that they used eight conductor cable because they couldn't get five conductor cable or six conductor cable and just didn't connect some of these. Now, this doesn't matter because we have to ohm it out anyway. So let's get to it. So we need to answer the simple question, which of these pins goes to which of these wires? And the ones we're interested in are two, four, and three, so we'll only pay attention to those. What we do need to do, however, is make sure that none of these are shorted together internally. Say, if pin one is shorted to pin two by these wires being soldered between them internally, because this is for some weird application, then plugging this into the MSX would destroy it and burn out the power supply, because there's five volts on pin one and ground on pin two, so we definitely need to check this out first. So I've got the hands that help. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna put this on the continuity setting. And we're just gonna check between each of the pins and make sure that none of them are connected to each other. That's easy enough. Looks good to me. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a test clip. So these are test clips. They're tremendously useful. They're much more useful than alligator clips for this sort of thing. When we press the button on the back of this, this little hook shoots out. When you let go of it, it pulls back in, which means that if in the intervening time you put a wire in between those, it's gonna hook onto it and stay. So since we're interested in pin two, we're gonna just hook onto that right there. And then that stays clipped on there. Now see if you used an alligator clip, it'd be too big. It'd run into the pins next to it and you'd get false positives. So we can leave that there and then clamp this back up. Now we're just gonna take the other end, clip it to one of our leads, and that leaves us a hand free to manipulate these while we go through and check them. Okay, ground is blue, and red is pin four. And finally, let's go to pin one, and that is purple, violet, whatever. So there it is, and we can snip everything else off. We don't need it. That will make it a lot easier to work with, and gang cut them. Now, immediately after doing that, I realized I fucked up. See. When those were sticking out, they had insulation all the way up to the ends. But when I cut them off, it crushed the insulation and now the copper is all just kind of stuck together. So I can push those apart with a probe, but then as soon as I put the heat shrink on, it's gonna pull them all back together. So I made a huge mistake here. I'm just gonna put a drop of super glue in the end there and that will keep them insulated from each other. Well, my glue is in sort of a weird, alternate gel state, so it didn't really go on there quite right. But it's working its way down in between the wires, so we should be okay. So while that's setting up, let's go ahead and prep the next cable. This cable goes from a pair of RCAs to this eighth inch tip ring sleeve connector. So I'm just gonna lop off the end here. Often what happens when I'm stripping these is I just annihilate this uh, braided metal shield which I don't want to do. I'm taking care not to squeeze all the way down on the pliers. The way we're going to do this is we're going to bind the grounds together because although these are two different connectors, uh, it's a common ground on the back end. So now we don't need this much ground wire and it's a lot harder to work with if we have it. So I'm going to go ahead and remove some of this. So I'm just going to pull this around here like that. I'm going to pull off about half of it. The reason I'm doing this is because although I want there to be a ground, it doesn't need to be a very great one. 
there's no significant current flowing through there and I don't need the wire to be shielded right up to the end or anything. So this does not need to be a complete braid. Everything's stripped and ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and proceed. So let's begin by stripping the audio wire. Okay. I almost forgot, we need to ohm out the other cable as well. Which one goes where? Red wire goes to the video. So I'm just gonna breathe a little bit of solder on these to tin them so that they're a little easier to work without breaking. By the way, I can't recommend these cleaners enough. They work so much better than the sponge. So we're just going to do a straight inline splice here, nothing fancy, no J-hooks or anything because this wire can't take it. Here we go. Now because we have the room to work with here and because these wires can't be allowed to touch each other, I'm going to go ahead and insulate this with my favorite implement medical tape. Again, this is not a great electrical insulator. However, it'll work. And all we need is something that just keeps the wires from touching. They're not high voltage. They're not going to arc. They're not going to get between the fibers. It'll it'll be fine. Trust me. Also, it's going to look ugly, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to put shrink over it when it's done. Okay, there we go. The cast will come off in three weeks. Might flip apart as soon as I put the heat on it, but we'll see. All right, that's done. And we're set. Holy mother of God. Forgot to put the shrink on. And this is the moment where you have to decide, do I take it all apart or do I just put a piece of tape on it? Now, I did it once, I can do it again, and I'll do it right. Okay, finally got it reworked. Good lord. Now when I first took this up, I want to first demonstrate to you why you should invest in a good quality composite monitor if you're going to do this. So let me plug the power in, make sure the power's on still. There we are, okay. I'm going to plug in the new video cable and we're gonna make sure that it still powers on. Okay, the reason we did that was to make sure we didn't short anything out. Typically, if you short out a piece of electronics, it'll kill the switching power supply right away. This is new enough that the power supply is almost certainly a switching supply. Had something been shorted out, the power light probably would have been dim or not come on at all. I'm going to plug this into my program monitor here. So this is a very, very nice Dell LCD. Uh, this is a 24 inch 1920 by 1200 display. Uh, with I think an IPS panel and I've used this and another one of them as my primary displays on my PC for a very long time. Now this has a composite video input. Go to input source. Input source, composite. And we'll turn it on. Well that didn't work at all. What went wrong? Yep. So why the hell doesn't it work? So what I was trying to demonstrate is that this monitor puts out a completely shredded image with tons of static and noise for no reason I can ascertain. Let me plug in the other monitor I have that doesn't do that and I'll show you what I mean. So this here is a Sony LMD1420. If you're familiar with the Sony PVM monitors, this thing probably looks familiar, what with the button array down here. That's because this is essentially an LCD PVM. Now before you get too excited, it looks kind of like shit. It certainly looks like shit compared to a PVM. It is not a PVM. 
However, what's special about it is that it was one of the only LCD monitors I know of that natively takes RGB and composite and has the Sony PVM quality input module. You can see here that it has the whole array of inputs that you would expect from PVM, and it has the pass-through so you can put video into it and then take the same video to ripple out to something else. So while this thing is not as good as a PVM, it's certainly extremely convenient. And I bring it up because yesterday, I jerry-rigged a connector from the video port on this to the program monitor that I was just trying to show you on, and the video came out all garbled and staticky and completely unusable. I thought that the MSX might be damaged, but before I opened it up, I went ahead and tried this monitor and it looked perfect. I'm the worst. I'm the worst. I looked at the male side of the DIN plug, not the female one, and wired it backwards. I have to rework it all again. Everything I did was wrong. Well, since we're here and it's working, I might as well demo it to you and then I'll fix the cable on my own time. 